Hey, just a heads up, this video contains spoilers for content that occurs after both Heaven's Ward and A Realm Reborn. So, if you haven't beaten the main story up to and including Endwalker, I highly suggest that you do not watch this video and come back later if you care about spoilers. Okay? Okay. You've been warned, so don't go and blame me. The Reflections of Hydaelyn are one of the most important elements of Final Fantasy XIV. In fact, they are so important to the plot of the game that they are almost, if not absolutely crucial to the story and the origins of the game we know today. And for that reason, they must be explained. So on today's episode of Explaining 14, we look at the history, the background, and the nitty gritty involving Hydaelyn's many reflections. And there's no better way to begin than with a history lesson. Ah, oh, there is a sight to bring a tear to the eye. You recognize these scenes? That I do. Indeed, there was a time when anyone and everyone would. Until one calamitous day when the world was divided across ten and three reflections sundering the land and all who dwelled upon it. And the worst part? No one could remember it. Not really. Just fragments and fleeting memories of an achingly familiar world. So long before anything that we knew was anything that we knew, there existed one singular world. Its name was Atheris, and Atheris was home to a people known as the Amrotines, a highly sophisticated race of humanoids that were so powerful that they could create things from practically nothing. The only thing they really required was an idea and just a little bit of ether, the dominant element of this world and where the star Atheris got its name. Anyways, this this world lived in relative peace. Well, that was until an event known as the Final Days engulfed the star and sent these creation magics wielded by the Amrot team spiraling out of control, forming monsters and demons and, and bad news all over the place from the imaginations of those who made up the world. To this end, to halt their coming doom, the Amrot teens made the ultimate sacrifice. Using half of what remained of Atheris's population, the denizens of Amarot pooled together their creation magics and wove into existence a god, a being that could thwart the final days and stabilize the stuff that would otherwise run rampant and destroy the world. This god's name was Zodiark, the first of the primals, Mac Daddy of all that would follow, and the savior of Atheris. Before the great sundering, there was one world, a world that knew naught but peace and prosperity until it was faced with a crisis, unprecedented, terrifying. Civilization found itself perched upon a precipice, staring into oblivion. But through prayer and sacrifice, the will of the star was made manifest. Zodiac was his name, and by his grace was the calamity averted. But despite the fact that Zodiac had covered the world in a barrier that prevented the final days, there were those of the survivors that did not approve of the new primal. They thought he was too powerful, that he could be used for ill or worse, go feral, and cause the doom of the star all over again. Not to mention that many believed that the only course of action following the final days was to commit more sacrifices to Zodiac so that he could return their world to the way it once was before everything went dumpster fire, a quick solution to an impossible problem. To that end, to avoid any unnecessary bloodshed, another group of Atheris' populace sacrificed themselves 
ironic, I know, to create another, a god with the sole purpose of securing Zodiac and ensuring that he could never do harm to the planet or set the world back to square one. At the heart of this, pun 100% intended, was an Amrotine known as Vana, who would be the catalyst for this new god, and she would be named Hydaelyn. With this new divine created, Hydaelyn worked to imprison Zodiac. Except, the thing was, Hydaelyn was a lot weaker than Zodiac. Zodiac was created using the life force of half the planet. Hydaelyn was created using the life force of only a select few. So there was an obvious power difference, one that would spell Hydaelyn's doom regardless of whatever she did. Despite this, Hydaelyn moved to do her duty, which she did so by using every bit of her power to deal a blow that sundered Zodiac into 14 distinct fragments, greatly weakening the primal and placing him in a dormant state, though this came at a cost. For you see, Zodiac had been bonded to the world. It was now he that commanded the elements that made up the world, and it was now he that dictated their course. So by shattering Zodiac, Hydaelyn also shattered the world as a whole, and it was here that the reflections of Hydaelyn were created. A savior mighty and magnificent, deserving of reverence and gratitude. One would have thought, yet some thought otherwise. From the fears of these naysayers would rise Hydaelyn, she who was to serve as his shackles, to bind him and hold him in check. And so they fought, and they fought, and they fought, and in the end, Hydaelyn was victorious. With all her strength, she smote him, dealing a blow so devastating that it split the very fabric of reality. And thus was Zodiac banished and his being divided. 14 shards of Zodiac there were, and so 14 shards of the world there would be, with one acting as the source of everything. And as it might sound, the reflections are reflections of Atheris, meaning they are these uh, uncanny versions of the world we strive to protect and defend. As revealed in Shadowbringers, we can see just how far these reflections reflect the world that they are based upon. For example, let us compare the first of the reflections to the source. Here is a map of Norvrant, a continent on the first. Here is a map of Eorzea, a continent on the source. Here are the two overlaid. As you can see, these two have a very similar layout, land structure, and population centers. This similarity also applies to not only the land, but to the people themselves. Here is Rowena of the House of Splendors on the source. Here is Moen of the Boutique of Splendors on the first. Here is Ardbert, a warrior of light that represents the first. And here is the canonical warrior of light that represents the source. Again, you can see just how similar everyone is, but it doesn't just stop there. The similarities also imply to the geography of the worlds, the environments, the cultures, etc, etc. And the reason why they are so similar, if you haven't figured it out yet, is because they are all different sides of the same coin. The source and its reflections, they are like pieces to a puzzle that have been scattered about. Upon them, they all have their own image, an incomplete image, mind you, but one that belongs to a larger portrait if properly placed together, which is exactly what one particular group has been intent on doing for thousands of years. Now, I should probably save this for a video on the Asians, but considering that it has to do with the reflections, the Asians, a group that should require no introduction, in all of their infinite wisdom, strove to see Atheris restored to its former glory, and sought to unite the shards of Hydaelyn and return Zodiac to his true state of power. And the Asians, they went about unsundering Zodiac by rejoining the reflections into the source, by placing pieces of the puzzle back where they belong in a process called a rejoining. We Asians know because it is our history, our story. It was we who summoned Zodiac, we natives of that sundered paradise. Now, 
Do you see why we yearn for the great rejoining? For our world. For our people. For all creation to be made whole again. Wouldn't you wish for the same? This process, the rejoining, is done by tipping the balance between light and dark of a world, the elements of the astral umbral calendar, to one side or the other. Because at the end of the day, there cannot be any one element without all the others. For example, if a world were to have too much light, the element most associated with Hydaelyn, the affected reflection will begin to freeze, the ether making up the world world will begin to stagnate, resulting in the reflection joining back into the source. In the ancient past, a single star was divided into 14 worlds. This is the source, your home. These others are the 13 shards, in whose number we find the first. Though physically separate, they retain a connection to each other and with the source especially. Now. Let us assume that a given element in one of the shards attains abnormal ascendancy. Just as water will flow from the highest point to the lowest, the excess energy will begin trickling into the source. Doing this, of course, is not without its issues for both that reflection and the source. As a result of a rejoining, the reflection in question will be completely wiped out and its essence will slowly re-emerge with that of the source. As for the source, the result of a rejoining will cause the world to suffer from a series of disastrous global phenomenon usually referred to as umbral calamities, which there have been seven in total. So that means, as of the current day, as of this video's upload date, there are only seven total reflections, the source included, out of the 14 that were created still remaining. All the others, they have been committed to a rejoining each causing an umbral calamity that drastically shaped the source into what it is today. For example, when one of the reflections was rejoined with the source, it caused a series of great floods that saw the beginning of the sixth umbral era, a time where most of the world was submerged in water. Later on, the rejoining of another shard, along with the fall of the moon Dalamud and the rampage of the primal Bahamut, greatly shifted the climates of the world and brought much ruin to the continent of Eorzea leading to places like Curthis being engulfed in a winter that shall never end. And in the future, a future that did not come to pass, mind you, the rampage of the plague Black Rose and the rejoining of the first with the source led to the eighth umbral calamity, a reality where chaos reigns and nothing impeded the Asians from unleashing Zodiark. But like I said, that fate was averted by an absolute Giga Chad and his merry band of hooligans. And so, with all that being said, I believe that explains the reflections of Hydaelyn, their history, and just how important they are to Final Fantasy XIV. So hey, if you enjoyed this video, if you would like to see more, please be sure to like and subscribe for more content relating to Final Fantasy XIV, World of Warcraft, Borderlands, and Star Wars. Of course, if you have any specific topics you would like for me to cover in the future regarding Final Fantasy XIV, the game, or its lore, you can leave them in the comment section down below, and I'll be sure to read each and every one of them. Thanks for watching, and remember well.